Hi, I'm Annie Baker. I'm a writer and director. And I'm very... <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. I love the Criterion Collection. It's meant a lot to me. And I'd say, like, while we were working together, like, I feel like we were constantly referencing all the movies in this closet. I'm Lucian Johnston. Uh, I'm a film editor. I helped Annie edit her film, Janet Planet. And, uh, yeah, I feel very lucky to be here. We're going to start with L'Enfance Nu by the director and writer, Maurice Pila, one of my favorite, favorite writer-directors. So this is from 1968. It's about um, kind of a foster child being shuttled around France and moving from family to family. It's like one of the most unsentimental movies about childhood I've ever seen. I felt like it was the first movie I'd seen with like a child lead who you didn't necessarily sympathize with for most of the movie. And then once you understand him by the end of it, it's like totally devastating. I feel like very at the mercy of PLA as a filmmaker when I'm watching his films, like kind of like anything could happen. I feel like yeah. the films are kind of out of control in a way that is like really like almost disturbing in a way that I think for some people that could be interpreted as like a cold approach or something, but there's no like calculation there. Okay, L'Argent. Other than Pila, the other filmmaker we talked about a lot when we were cutting Janet Planet was uh, Brisson. I feel like Brisson was more of like an aesthetic like reference for us too. I, I remember specifically about L'Argent, we were talking about depictions of off-screen violence. Yes, that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, I always think of the end when um, at the farm, the old couple, the when the husband slaps his wife, it's instead of seeing the slap, he cuts away, and you just see the the teacup on the on the little saucer, and it just kind of moves a little bit. I think he has a thing about suppressing intention, and this idea of like actually, what you need to do is like suppress people's intentions, and yeah. so accidents can happen. Oh yeah, matter of life and death. Okay, initially in Janet Planet, we were going to have a character disappear on screen. I don't feel like that's giving away too much. And we were obsessed with how to do it, and we ended up just not doing it. But I kept watching the disappearances in this movie on the Criterion channel and sending them to you, and you would, like, calculate how many frames the disappearance was, and it's, like, three. For me, there's just something about the way that Powell and Pressburger films look that is... That's why I love them so much. I mean, they're... Cinematographer Jack Cardiff was incredible, but there's just nothing that looks like a Powell and Pressburger film. There's some scene near the beginning where, like, the fog lifts, and it's so trippy. Do you know what I'm talking about, like, at the beach? And I yeah. remember reading, I got really into reading Michael Powell's memoir, and it just was Jack Cardiff, like, breathing on the lens. Yeah, we'll not, we're really not. Okay, I, Godland. God, I'll do Godland. This movie was one of my very, very top favorites of 2023, and maybe ever. The DP is our amazing DP, Maria von Hauswolf. And so much of watching this movie for me was like seeing Maria, the way Maria sees nature and the world through the way she shot this movie. Mm. And it makes me so, so happy. I think in particular of like a, a, a shot, um, a sort of like descending shot of a waterfall. At one point, one of those like incredibly humongous Icelandic waterfalls. And there's this moment where the camera sort of almost like pauses and wavers in the middle. Because the camera kind of stops and then keeps going, it, it almost feels like an accident or something. And I've yeah. seen you get those types of like happy accidents in performance a lot. Like I see that a lot when I'm cutting performances where an actor will kind of mess something up or say the wrong line, but it's it's really good and, and it, it almost better than what it was supposed to be. So you just kind of roll with it. But I've never seen that with, like, a camera before. Yeah, and, but yeah. that sequence, I think that's what's so kind of magical about it, is in any other film, you would bump on that. And instead of bumping, it kind of just, like, 
elevates the sequence well, it feels even like more. Nature. Such, yes, it, it, it feels like nature. It feels like of it is yeah. Yeah, and the unexpected. I, I don't know. I feel like so they, that was a really difficult shoot. Apparently, they actually like made the journey themselves across Iceland that the characters making in the movie. They shot with all natural light except for like two scenes that were just candlelight. I mean, it's it's like literally about nature overtaking man, and then I feel like actually you feel that. It's happening with the filmmaking, too. Design for Living. Um, I'm obsessed with this movie. I have a poster of this movie in my study. Well, this is like from 1933. This is like immediately pre-code. It wouldn't even be made now because it's like so ambiguous. Ambiguous, but also like incredibly blatant. Like I think what's yeah, so- Yeah, she's in love with two men. They're kind yeah. of in love with her. I mean, they're in, totally in love with her. She's in love with them. The end of the movie, she's like making out with both of them in the back of a car. So this was based on a Noel Coward play, but apparently yeah. the first scene of this movie, which is one of my favorite scenes, was not in the Noel Coward play, where she's like in the train car and they're sleeping and they haven't seen her yet and she's drawing them. Right. And Frederick March and Gary Cooper are so incredible and beautiful and like hilarious and vulnerable and doofy. And Miriam Hopkins is like such a specific person and she's also into her work and there's something about the movie that I find so life affirming yeah. about like work and desire. Um, oh yeah. Well, I do. <laughs> it's always. I feel like we're just talking about. It's like talking about Varda and Persson and Pilas. Oh, so wow, this is uh, so good. There's so much good yeah. stuff. Do you on have this. this? I don't think you I do. You should take it. You should take it. I, I'm going to totally butcher this. This, but um, Daguerreotype is my fav favorite of all the films in this collection, I think. The reason I like it so much is because I find it very difficult to talk about film editing, um, even as an editor. It just, of all the film crafts, it's kind of the impossible one to actually talk about well, I think. It, a lot of people like to talk about pace or things like that, but that's just one really, really little thing. It's, it's very difficult to actually talk about film editing, but in this film, there's a sequence in one of the local cafes where a magician is is putting on his act, and during that sequence, she's showing you how she's kind of making the associations while she's making them. She's kind of showing you the manipulation of the work, and it, it's very self-conscious, but it's not academic. There's nothing, like, didactic about the way she's showing it to you. It's very, very playful, mm. and there's it, it's just kind of... It feels almost like a precursor to some something like what... Um, to like maybe what like John Wilson is doing now. It's some of the best editing I've ever seen, and you can see it, because most of the time you can't see editing, but in this film you can see it, and That makes um, me really love when you watch it. Should we switch names for the end? <laughs> I'm Lucian Johnson. You just sign I off. Edited, I... <laughs> I'm an editor. I edited Bo is Afraid, Stop. Macbeth, Midsommar. I'm one of the greats. Thank you. <laughs>